Good morning. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, uh, a, a nonpartisan think tank based in Philadelphia. Uh, this morning, we are very fortunate to have Ambassador B. Kim Xiao uh, joining us. She's the representative of Taiwan to the United States of America. And um, she'll be talking this morning about the U.S.-Taiwan relationship and prospects for the future. Um, moderating this conversation will be Jacques Delisle, who is the director of FBI's Asia program. Uh, Jacques is also the Stephen A. Cousin Professor of Law, Professor of Political Science, and Director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, before I turn it over to Jacques to introduce Ambassador Xiao, um, I want to uh, take care of a couple of housekeeping things. First of all, if you would like to ask a question, uh, you can hover over your screen and you should find a bar that has a couple of boxes and a question mark in one of those boxes. And if you click on that, a window will appear um, in your screen on the right side of your screen and you'll see a place to enter your questions there. Um, Finally, before I turn it over to Jacques, I'd also like to thank our supporters and members and our board members who are on this call this morning uh, for their generous support. We couldn't do it without you. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jacques. Well, thank you, Raleigh, and thank you everyone for joining us this morning. It's my pleasure to welcome to this FPRI webinar, Abi Kim Xiao. Uh, Ambassador Xiao is Taiwan's representative to the U.S. She's been in that role here since July 2020. That means she's the head of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in Washington uh, and the equivalent of an ambassador uh, for a country with which we maintain formal diplomatic relations. She's had a truly distinguished career in politics and public service in Taiwan. She's served in other posts under the president, under President Tsai Ing-wen. Uh, she was senior advisor on the National Security Council and before that under President Chen Shui-bian. She was an advisor in the office of the president. She's also served in Taiwan's legislature, the Legislative Yuan, where she served four terms, variously representing uh, overseas Taiwanese uh, and the uh, citizens of Taipei and of Hualien. In the Legislative Yen, when the DPP was in the minority, she was the ranking member of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee and chair of the USA Caucus in the LY. Uh, she's long been highly visible in uh, Democratic Progressive Party politics, especially to foreigners uh, who are interested in Taiwan, uh, including her role as director of the DPP's International Affairs Department and spokesperson for DPP presidential candidates uh, for over a decade. She's a friend of democracy at home and abroad, having served as chair of the Council of Asian Liberals and Democrats uh, and um, vice president of the Liberal International and a founding board member of the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, uh, which among many other things produces the Taiwan Journal of Democracy, which I recommend to those of you interested in those issues. She has a truly cosmopolitan background. She was born in Kobe, Japan, grew up in Tainan in Taiwan, uh, and was educated at Oberlin and Columbia University here in the US. She's a frequent visitor to the US, even when she's not uh, serving an ambassadorial uh, type role here. Uh, so it's a great pleasure, somewhat belatedly, to welcome you back to a country you know so well uh, in your new role, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have a lot to cover, uh, but one of the things that's been in the news recently has been the economic dimension of U.S.-Taiwan relations. Uh, Taiwan is, of course, a hugely important player in the international economy, the 10th largest trading country by uh, by goods uh, measures, uh, or sorry, 17th, I guess, world, worldwide, 10th with the U.S., um, and an important provider and recipient of foreign direct investment, very big in global supply chains and in the tech sector, uh, and has been in the WTO for a couple of decades. Uh, but Taiwan does not have a bilateral trade agreement of a robust FTA sort uh, with the United States. And of course, those agreements now take in trade and investment. But we saw something of a breakthrough this summer uh, when President Tsai announced that she was going to move forward with removing one of the long term stumbling blocks that has uh, been in the way of a bilateral agreement, uh, particularly the, the issues of beef and pork exports from the U.S. Uh, to Taiwan, and I think it's fair to say the U.S. has responded favorably to that. So what do you see as the prospects for moving forward on a bilateral trade agreement or uh, other aspects of improving the economic relationship? Sorry, you hear me now? Okay. 
Um, well, thank you uh, for inviting me and for arranging this opportunity for some dialogue and discussion on the bilateral Taiwan US relationship. Um, your question uh, regarding uh, the trade and economic relationship uh, is certainly one of the top priorities uh, of my agenda here in Washington, D.C., uh, in addition uh, to the very important security and defense relationship that we have. Um, and I want to make a few points on the, uh, a, a trade, uh, the, the trade area. Um, first, I want to say that um, a bilateral trade agreement um, has not only economic significance, it also has strategic uh, significance. Um, Taiwan is the ninth largest trading partner of the United States, um, and our economies are highly complementary. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion on semiconductor chips lately and their, the crucial role that they play in the auto industry here in the United States. Um, since our economies are so highly complementary, a trade agreement would be good for both of us. Uh, it would also provide the infrastructure for strengthening those bilateral trade relations. The second point I want to make is on Taiwan's uh, preparedness. Um, as you indicated, uh, President Tsai um, last August um, made an announcement to remove uh, market access barriers for U.S. beef and pork. Um, although in terms of the, the overall contribution to the bilateral trade in actual numbers, uh, it is not uh, tremendously significant, but uh, as a barrier and obstacle uh, to the two sides discussing um, deepening our trade relationship. Unfortunately, um, these issues have become an impediment for over a decade. And so resolving these issues uh, have been uh, very significant. Um, but it is, um, I admit, a very painful process. Um, you know, agriculture um, is politically significant in every, in, in every country. And this gesture has been met by very fierce uh, political opposition uh, in Taiwan. Uh, but Japan went through it, uh, South Korea went through it. Uh, these processes in terms of um, um, preparing uh, for uh, negotiating trade agreements. Um, and you know, this, these obstacles have also, I want to say, existed uh, for over, as I said, over a decade. And these cross different administrations, the Republicans, the Democrats, um, the KMT and the DPP in Taiwan. And so uh, we see re resolution of these issues uh, as a demonstration of Taiwan's determination to align our trade practices with international standards, uh, including uh, internationally recognized scientific standards for food safety. And this is key to also building U.S. confidence in Taiwan as a worthy partner for trade negotiations. I think a third point I want to make is that um, support for this here in the United States is uh, truly bipartisan. Um, President Tsai's gestures uh, have been applauded by bipartisan members of Congress as well as uh, leaders in both the previous Trump and current Biden administration. Uh, they have indicate, uh, you know, so I, I believe this indicates a growing momentum uh, here in the United States uh, in favor of this process. Uh, although President Biden has uh, said that he will hold off on broad trade agreements in the initial phase of his administration, uh, I think we should not waste any time in terms of making preparations and laying the groundwork down. And since there is interest on both sides in resuming TIFA talks, we also hope to launch discussions as soon as the confirmation uh, for the new USTR leadership uh, passes. Um, Taiwan has progressed significantly uh, in our labor and environmental standards, and so we are confident that we would be in a position to negotiate a high standard agreement that can also be an example for other economies. And finally, I want to say on this particular matter that um, there's been uh, some progress on our bilateral economic relationship uh, since President Tsai's announcement. Um, and I want to highlight the launching of the Economic Partnership Dialogue last November, uh, in which we made progress on discussing supply chain security, 5G, science and technology cooperation, investment screening, and of course, many other issues. And uh, we hope that this dialogue and the working groups that were created as a result of this uh, significant dialogue uh, will continue into the new administration. 
Yes, well, as you say, as uh, people from both parties in both countries and, and probably everywhere around the world will will tell you about the headaches of uh, the agricultural sector, small in trade, but but politically influential. And as you point out, uh, the bigger part of the U.S.-Taiwan economic relationship is in the tech sector uh, and, and other such areas. Um, so you, you mentioned the positive U.S. response that has strong battled administrations and absolutely a fair characterization, but the U.S. Trade Representative's office was relatively trade skeptical, I think one could say, uh, under Lighthizer and the Trump administration. We now likely have coming in Catherine Tai, who is uh, raised in Taiwan and has been fairly critical of China's trade practices. Uh, does the change in leadership at USTR, is that a cause for optimism in moving forward on the issues you've just been talking about? Well, you know, since these issues have been a sticking point for over a decade, um, I, I think the uh, former USTR felt that they needed some time to observe how Taiwan would actually implement uh, the uh, market access opening policy, and which uh, didn't go into effect until this January. And so uh, there was a factor of timing. Uh, there was also a factor of um, uh, uh, um, having the right personnel uh, in place to uh, enable TIFA and other uh, talks to carry on. And so um, we, we do hope that uh, with an incoming administration and new personnel being confirmed to the positions, uh, that that would also open some uh, opportunities. And given the fact that there is bipartisan support for uh, strengthening trade relations, uh, even if the administration, uh, the U.S. administration at this stage is not prepared for broader comprehensive trade agreements, uh, I think there is that momentum for building up um, the, the building blocks necessary uh, to make um, our trade relationship much more productive, uh, much more effective, and certainly um, create uh, the broader incentives uh, for deepening uh, that trade relationship. So one of the reasons that a bilateral trade agreement with the U.S. is so important to Taiwan is the difficulty Taiwan has had in reaching trade agreements uh, with many other countries. Of course, been in the WTO, and that gets you somewhere. Uh, but much of the action in trade in recent years has been in the mega regional trade agreements, the TPP, which has now become the CPTPP with the U.S. opting out. Uh, and of course, the RCEP, which is more of a Beijing led uh, block. And of course, Taiwan's difficulty in entering these agreements has been largely opposition from Beijing. Uh, do you think there is a role for the U.S. to play or that you would like to see the U.S. play in helping Taiwan pursue membership, uh, presumably more likely in the uh, CPTPP than the RCEP, where U.S. influence is, shall we say, limited? Well, uh, first of all, Taiwan does seek to join uh, CPTPP. And um, it is important that we are incorporated uh, into meaningful regional trade infrastructure. Um, however, there's not much clarity on uh, U.S. policy towards CPTPP uh, since it's a withdrawal from the TPP uh, at this stage. Uh, but we are in consultation with various other member economies uh, to build support for Taiwan's participation uh, in CPTPP. Once there's um, some greater clarity on um, the accession of new members and procedures and um, uh, uh, related to that, um, we certainly hope to make some progress. But I do want to say that U.S. leadership is uh, very important. And so we are hoping that um, building some momentum on bilateral trade with the United States uh, would uh, also serve as an engine uh, for encouraging other uh, countries in the region uh, to also engage in trade discussions with Taiwan. So you alluded a moment ago to the security elements of the economic relationship. Uh, and of course, uh, we're all living in the world of the U.S.-China, what's often called a trade war, but is really a much bigger economic conflict and is in many ways a tech war. Uh, Taiwan's in a particularly complicated and in some ways difficult position there. Uh, so you know, Taiwan is deeply uh, enmeshed in the global value and supply chains that, that link China and the United States and many other places. U.S. restrictions on the exports of certain technology, certain chips, uh, poses some challenges to some Taiwanese companies. For instance, TSMC, uh, which is a you know, huge uh, semiconductor uh, firm in Taiwan that uh, sells a lot to Huawei, does a lot of, uh, has a strong relationship with U.S. high-tech suppliers. How is Taiwan going to navigate uh, the, the difficulties uh, posed here, and are there challenges, uh, do the challenges come with some opportunities? There is lots of talk about rearranging supply chain security, 
uh, of supply chains that, that argue for a move away uh, from mainland sources. So things pulling in both directions. How do you see the, the tech restrictions and the security concerns about tech affecting Taiwan and its economic relationship with the US? Well, um, first of all, I want to say that companies like TSMC, um, the semiconductor and technology industries um, in Taiwan, um, they are global companies essentially. And so they do have interest in both China and the United States. Um, in, in terms of um, the protection of privacy and technology, uh, we are very much aligned with uh, U.S. interest in ensuring the integrity of how technology is used um, as um, elements of human progress instead of uh, tools for surveillance and controlling uh, citizens in authoritarian ways. Um, so uh, there, it's a very complicated process, of course. There's the broader consumer uh, end technology. There's a defense, uh, the use in uh, defense and other um, highly sensitive areas as well. Um, but I want to say that overall, um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, it's, you know, there are politics involved, there are security issues involved, there's all, there are also markets involved. And um, our companies are certainly looking at ways to position themselves uh, so that um, their interests uh, can be maximized. In terms of export controls uh, of the United States um, that have been, been ongoing and certainly have impacted Taiwan um, industry, um, our companies have very much, pretty much been in compliance of U.S. export uh, control policies. But uh, we do hope that uh, as we move on, uh, there will be more discussions on uh, the scope and the breadth of, of these export controls and how they do impact the global supply chain. Um, a third point I want to make is that um, uh, semiconductor chips are in tremendous demand now. And um, uh, at the export control policies put into place have not affected at all the market demand. And um, uh, many Taiwanese um, semiconductor firms are looking at further expansions, which does include an already announced uh, TSMC investment project here in the United States. Um, uh, estimated at uh, 12 billion U.S. dollars, which will, um, if it goes through, will likely become one of the largest foreign direct investments here in the United States. But I think, um, which I want to move on to the fourth point, uh, this does strategically uh, link our interests together in terms of um, the production of technology where there is due protection of uh, intellectual property rights, um, the use of technology, and also um, you know, privacy uh, protections, et cetera, um, but also the, um, the, the supply chain and the security as such, I think will also be an increasingly important factor as so many more new products are increasingly dependent on semiconductors. Um, we are looking into a discussion with the U.S. side on uh, some of the policy incentives that the U.S. government might think about uh, could, might, might consider, uh, including uh, some of the elements that have been in the National Defense Authorization Act, but uh, might depend, depend um, on commerce policy in terms of implementation. Um, and I think these policies um, initially uh, proposed in the CHIPS Act in Congress, which again is a bipartisan initiative uh, highlighting uh, the importance of uh, further investing in this uh, strategic industry. Um, it, it, it will, um, if implemented well, uh, I believe will provide greater incentives for uh, the further integration of our industries, uh, the forging of common interests, and further securing those supply chains. So, so you mentioned a couple of times the bipartisan support for a stronger relationship between the U.S. and Taiwan, bipartisan support in the U.S., uh, and it has been an interesting four years on that, on that front. Um, uh, yeah, Taiwan and the U.S. obviously have a long history of relations. It goes back more than seven decades uh, now, and Taiwan has changed hugely uh, since the late 1940s. Uh, the U.S. has changed some too, of course, but not quite as much. Uh, and we've had some ups and downs. Uh, during your uh, first tour in, in government in Taiwan, there were some bumpy moments uh, during, during President Chen's tenure, uh, but uh, his successor, President Ma, uh, described U.S.-Taiwan relations during his tenure as being the best they had been since before the end of formal relations in 79. And during the four years that President Tsai and President Trump 
have been in office. Uh, it's in a sense, in a sense, gone from strength to strength. You've mentioned some of the legislation. Uh, there's a whole raft of it: three National Defense Authorization Acts, the Taiwan Travel Act, the Taipei Act, the Asian Reassurance Initiative Act, the Taiwan Assurance Act. Uh, just an alphabet soup of of uh, congressional legislation. Uh, higher level visits uh, being advocated and followed through on. Uh, more regular arms sales. A lot of good news there. Uh, and indeed, at the 11th hour, as, as the Trump administration was headed out the door, uh, a formal lifting of the cap on, on seniority of, of, of visits and, and an aborted um, uh, plan to send the US UN ambassador. So, pretty steep upward trajectory. Uh, now you've got a new administration. You've got the Biden administration. Uh, you were at the inauguration. Uh, you had a conversation with the now Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, uh, in the, I guess the post election period. Uh, pre pre inauguration. So you've you've uh, been watching the U.S. for a long time. You've seen a lot of presidential administrations come and go. Uh, do you think uh, what has been a very positive relationship from Taiwan's view uh, is going to continue in the Biden administration? And do you see any causes for concern? Well, um, yeah, I, I think you're right to point out that our relationship has continued to grow and blossom, and it has certainly been strengthened, of course, uh, for many factors. I think um, confidence and trust in President Tsai's uh, balanced approach uh, to external relations uh, is one important factor. Uh, changing global circumstances, especially on the geo political and geostrategic front um, um, have also been a factor. I think a third factor is um, the performance of the people of Taiwan um, in successfully working together to combat COVID, uh, to demonstrate the strength of Taiwan's democracy, uh, good governance, accountability, and all of those values that are um, that many Americans also hold deeply. I think all of these uh, lay the important foundation for uh, building a stronger relationship. And um, you know, of course, many of my predecessors and their hard work and 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 um, uh, progress that has been made in the past um, also contribute th to this important foundation. Um, as we move ahead, um, I have emphasized the bipartisan support for Taiwan here in the United States, and I think those factors that have led to a positive. A development in our relationship uh, do uh, exist and will remain in the coming years. Um, and we are we've been off to a good start. Um, you 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 pointed out that um, I was uh, certainly I, I felt honored uh, to have been invited uh, in person uh, to attend President Biden's uh, inauguration. And also uh, we have heard some positive statements, uh, welcoming statements from um, on the U.S.-Taiwan relationship uh, from Secretary Blinken and Secretary uh, Austin of the Defense Department. And, and I think all of this does highlight uh, the significance and the strength of uh, what we have. And uh, we do look forward to working with this next administration in a very positive way. And that, there was a quite striking statement from the State Department a few days after the inauguration saying that the U.S. was quite concerned about uh, China's ongoing attempts to intimidate Taiwan, urge Beijing to stop the economic, diplomatic and military uh, coercion and uh, said that the U.S. approach to allies and the friends and allies in the region included deepening ties uh, with Taiwan. And, and the phrase that's been used a couple of times is the relationship is rock solid, yeah. uh, which is uh, perhaps a pun on ROC. I'm not quite sure, uh, but the uh, the, so there's a lot of, of positive stuff there, um, but areas in which the Biden administration is thought likely to depart from the Trump administration, there, there are a whole bunch of them, so we can maybe go through them in a couple of pieces. Uh, one that I, one that has been much stressed is the U.S. returning to values issues in foreign policy, stressing democracy, human rights, things like that, uh, and re-engaging with uh, the rules-based international order, major international institutions. Um, and uh, of course, um, uh, a, a re-engagement with friends and allies in the Asia Pacific and the Indo-Pacific. And that sounds like there's some opportunities for Taiwan there. Is this a significant change in tone or is this just, um, you know, tweaking around the edges in terms of interest for Taiwan? Well, you know, as I said in, in our previous um, um, a question or dialogue that um, the 
the the factors that forge the foundation for a strong relationship uh, do remain, and I think that remains constant. Um, in terms of uh, an approach uh, towards Taiwan of the new administration, I think these uh, different emphasis uh, the the emphasis that you have laid out. Uh, human rights, democracy, the values involved, working with allies, uh, working with international uh, multilateral institutions. Um, I, I don't think um, any of these uh, would eventually become a problem for Taiwan. In fact, I think these are uh, additional positive factors uh, that would help to highlight the significance of our relationship. For example, um, I, I do feel that um, the invitation for me to be part of and to observe the uh, Biden uh, uh, inauguration um, was a recognition of the fact that Taiwan's an important democratic partner, democratic in the small d, of course. Um, we we share common values uh, as well as common interests, and these will uh, certainly continue on. Um, in terms of international institutions, uh, we um, have been trying to work with the United States and others uh, to uh, gain some meaningful participation in the World Health Organization. And we uh, really have appreciated U.S. support for that. Um, and uh, we certainly hope that there could be a growing group of like-minded countries around the world that would also support that um, in terms of uh, international institutions and Taiwan having a meaningful role to play in there. Um, on, on the aspect of uh, U.S. Uh, strengthening and coordinating uh, strategies with allies. Uh, this is um, certainly a, a welcome uh, de um, development. Um, um, I, I think there was um, uh, quite meaningful coordination in the Asia Pacific region uh, in the last few years, despite some um, external criticism. I think um, there are some, some countries in the region uh, who have shared interests in regional stability and um, the peaceful resolution of some disputed areas uh, have actually been in close coordination with the U.S. government, and we do expect that that will continue on as well. So there's a question in the, the chat function here, which I think ties in what we're just talking about. Those are all the positives, definitely, uh, but no relationship is perfect. Uh, so uh, the question is, what do you see as the biggest challenges for U.S.-Taiwan relations going forward. And if I can just add to that, one of the things that strikes a lot of Americans as kind of odd, uh, particularly people who are big D Democrats in the United States, uh, is the enthusiasm for Trump uh, in Taiwan and in Hong Kong too, for that matter, uh, to the point where there was a fair amount of worry uh, voiced in some quarters in Taiwan about what would happen if Biden won, that that might not be so good. Uh, for Taiwan. And some of that, of course, is just the enemy of my enemy is my friend. You know, tr Trump uh, had a quite sour relationship with China and that uh, I think you know, puts Taiwan's security concerns uh, higher on the agenda. Uh, but but what do you what do you see as, as the more difficult issues in the relationship? And how would you explain to an American audience what seemed to be a, a fairly uh, great deal of enthusiasm for uh, Trump in Taiwan, unlike in many other democracies that are friendly with the United States, particularly in the West? Well, uh, first, I want to say that as a government, you know, we never take position on domestic U.S. politics. And so uh, any um, speculation that our government was siding with either side in the electoral process is just totally uh, untrue. I, I, I didn't try. Excuse um, me, I did not mean to suggest that the government was. I'm just saying yeah. you, know, you see commentators, you see a lot of politically informed opinion in Taiwan where the sort of the, the, the political and policy intelligentsia were in Taiwan compared to a lot of other democratic countries, relatively pro-Trump, relatively less pro-Biden, just as a comparative matter. So let me just clear that up. Yeah, I, I understand your point, but I, I do think I have to reiterate um, our position that we don't um, get involved in partisan politics in the United States, although we do have an important stake in uh, the resilience of American democracy. And so, um, you know, we, we found um, the January 6th events are quite troubling, uh, but um, um, the restoration of constitutional order in the United States, the strength of the United States uh, is always something I think that is welcomed by other like-minded uh, democracies who share uh, similar values. Um, 
the the sentiments in Taiwan, I think that were kind of reflected on the previous uh, U.S. President Trump, I think has an element of um, him being uh, pre uh, presenting a persona of being tough on China. And uh, pr that's perhaps why many of the um, dissidents in Hong Kong, uh, many of the overseas Chinese um, dissidents and democratic, uh, uh, you know, democracy activists as well uh, also um, had the concern about um, about uh, uncertainty uh, where the next administration might stand in terms of China. Uh, but I think we've all been reassured um, that there is some continuity in terms of um, an understanding uh, that we're dealing with a very different China, a very different global situation. And um, there are uh, an increasing number of areas uh, where there is competition, where there is adversity. And of course, uh, they are also identifying po possible areas of cooperation as well. But I think um, um, as we move ahead, what's important is constant communication uh, about intentions um, in terms of objectives, um, strategies, um, that is all important. And uh, coordination between the U.S. and Taiwan is significant, but also coordination with other uh, stakeholders and uh, like-minded countries uh, in the region like Japan, Australia, um, New Zealand, uh, India, um, other countries. That's also an important process. And again, I want to say that we are off to a good start. Um, the Secretary Blinken, uh, Secretary L uh, Austin's uh, statements again uh, have been uh, well appreciated and, and much reported uh, in Taiwan and uh, we will work with uh, the new administration again um, you know gradually building the confidence necessary but I do want to make a final point is that and, and that is there are a number of U.S. officials uh, that have been appointed or in the process of being confirmed that uh, know Taiwan well uh, they are um, not only in their professional expertise, but their strategic views and practical experience uh, do, um, I think, um, demonstrate some degree of uh, reassurance to many friends around Asia. And uh, we do look forward to working with them. Yes, again, of course, you have Catherine Tai, who's deeply experienced having growing up in Taiwan. You have Kurt Campbell coming in as the Asia's are on the National Security uh, uh, Commission uh, uh, Committee. And so, you know, I think part of also what lay behind some of the skepticism toward the Biden administration from unofficial commentators uh, in Taiwan was uh, not just that 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 um, uh, Trump had you know, taken a tough line on China and that aligned some with Taiwan's interests, but the, the some of the people we've just mentioned here uh, do have roots in the Obama administration and even the Clinton administration. And that was an era of constructive engagement. That was an era when every few years somebody would write the article that said the U.S. should abandon Taiwan and policy turf circles would get a flutter for a brief period and then thing would, things would stabilize. Uh, so I won't put you too much on the spot on this, but do feel free to, 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 uh, to comment. Um, but you know that era is gone, isn't it? I mean, we have uh, intelligent, informed people who uh, see a different China than they saw, or a different Chinese behavior anyway than they saw in the 2000s. Well, I, I think um, our interests are so much aligned uh, that um, support, mutual support, is has becoming an assumed factor in our relationship. Um, and you know, for Taiwan, our primary objective is Taiwan's survival as a democracy and our right to determine our future uh, through democratic and peaceful means. For, um, for the U.S., the objective is regional stability as well as credibility towards uh, regional allies. And uh, so I think there is a lot of um, alignment in terms of our expectation for cooperation in stability in the Taiwan Strait area, uh, in maintaining the status quo, uh, which has also been a goal uh, expressed by President Tsai. And um, uh, we, we certainly will continue to pursue our relations uh, based on those common interests. And um, I think China has um, become much more uh, aggressive in the region. And there are many um, gestures of coercion. Um, militarily, economically, uh, politically that have been applied to Taiwan for decades. Um, but now these uh, coercive gestures are also being applied to some other countries. And so, uh, you know, it is not something that Taiwan faces alone. I think uh, there are 
uh, now many more um, partners and countries uh, in the region uh, who do understand um, the, the complexity of dealing with uh, these multiple co coercive efforts and the sophistication of that. So um, I think there's certainly greater room for dialogue, cooperation and building up on those common interests. So uh, how would you rate US credibility in the region at this point? It's been a subject of much discussion here in the US. Well, the US uh, remain, remains uh, one of the most significant, significant players uh, for Taiwan. Uh, the US is the most uh, significant uh, security partner for Taiwan. Um, in fact, it is uh, it remains the only country in the world willing and able uh, to support Taiwan in our self-defense. And that is also um, uh, with a legal basis for that, the Taiwan Relations Act. And um, so, so we do have to work together uh, closely uh, with the United States. And this process has been ongoing. We're building on, on top of a already very strong relationship as we move ahead. Uh, so we, we, we do have that uh, confidence uh, in place. Um, I, I think there is also uh, some, some assurance in the region um, uh, given uh, some recent action and some early statements of the Biden administration and uh, we will have to continue to build on that. So there are several questions in the, the chat that speak to the escalation of pressure uh, by uh, Beijing toward Taiwan. We've seen much more military activity. Uh, we've seen the loss of the former mostly de facto respect for the median line and the strait. We've seen Chinese military activities to the east of Taiwan. Uh, we've seen a lot of sort of gray zone uh, activities. Um, so how does Taiwan cope with that? What's the U.S. role in helping? And is existing U.S. policy adequate? Is the tradition of strategic ambiguity uh, enough where China is exerting pressure and coercion on Taiwan in ways that are not the old scenario of, you know, will they do a blockade? Will there actually be military action? Are, are we prepared to deal with this? And how do the U.S. and Taiwan cooperate to deal with that? Well, the um, increasing aggressiveness of some intrusions into the air defense identification zone of Taiwan has certainly been very problematic. Uh, in terms of the U.S. position, we saw that clearly laid out in the State Department's uh, statement last Saturday uh, on uh, Chinese fighter jet activities. Um, of course, there are many other uh, means of coercion, and you uh, use the word gray zone areas, uh, and and that is uh, quite worrisome. It extends uh, from not only the hard military um, uh, provocations, but also uh, cyberspace intrusions, um, other political influence operations in our society, disinformation campaigns, psychological warfare. Uh, it does cover many fronts. And, and so I think our security partnership uh, with the United States uh, today is now more important than ever. Um, in, in terms of um, having, you know, forging kind of a, a common strategy uh, there, I think there is a, a lot of agreement in uh, are the asymmetrical uh, warfare um, strategy that Taiwan is pursuing, and that is uh, reflected in our arms, arms sales uh, requests and the decisions. Uh, it's also reflected in, in uh, many areas of the training and cooperation uh, that does uh, exist between our countries. And so it is, uh, there's a discussion, as you know, in Washington about whether uh, the long-standing but never terribly clearly defined policy of strategic ambiguity uh, is, is adequate. Do you have a view on that or is that purely a, a U.S. policy side matter? Well, it seems that there's a lot of um, you know, discussion here in the United States and we watch uh, that with a lot of interest. Um, you know, there are uh, many you know, gray areas between clarity and ambiguity, of course, uh, different degrees of clarity and different degrees of ambiguity. Um, and we are uh, certainly watching with much interest. We have a few questions in the chat function about the sad events in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And of course, the uh, issues that began with the controversy over the extradition bill, which was ostensibly about dealings with Taiwan, but was really about 
uh, mainland encroachment on, on Hong Kong's autonomy led to the protests that evolved into a broader revival of the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong. And President Tsai's uh, victory in 2020 in the per presidential re-election bid was, I think, influenced by the way many in Taiwan and around the world, especially in Taiwan, the voters in Taiwan, uh, looked at what was going on in Hong Kong. Uh, could you speak to the impact of Hong Kong on Taiwan's thinking about dealing with the mainland and uh, if it has implications for Taiwan's relationship with the United States? Well, um, I, I think the Hong Kong um, developments are very significant in multiple ways. Um, first of all, um, it, it does demonstrate uh, uh, Beijing's uh, own violation of its commitments um, to the one country, two systems uh, system and very much intervening in the um, civil rights of the people of Hong Kong, and, and that is certainly very problematic. It does uh, affect um, the public perceptions uh, in Taiwan, and um, in terms of a political impact, I think it has strengthened the resolve of the people of Taiwan uh, to defend our democracy. Uh, we do not want to be uh, another Hong Kong. We are not a Hong Kong. Uh, we have um, some fundamental freedoms and basic rights so that we are even more determined than ever to defend. Uh, so uh, we have another question in the in the chat about Taiwan's uh, relationships uh, elsewhere. And I know this isn't formally your brief, but you're deeply knowledgeable about Taiwan's external relations. So the question is, what about the EU? Uh, there's been a lot of attention uh, in uh, the United States to the recent EU-China uh, uh, trade, uh, trade investment agreement. Uh, how's Taiwan doing with, with Europe? Well, we are, um, you know, the, the, unlike the United States, uh, has a Taiwan Relations Act, uh, security commitments and other commitments uh, to Taiwan and supporting our democracy. Uh, we don't have the same kind of legal framework. Uh, however, uh, we do have common values as well as interests, and uh, we do seek to build on that. I think, um, you know, COVID-19 and Taiwan's handling of the pandemic has really um, highlighted uh, the role that Taiwan can play in terms of contributing uh, to the international society, the expertise, the abilities, uh, as well as the generosity of the people of Taiwan have been highlighting, ha have, have been highlighted throughout this process. And so the, I, over the past year, there's been a greater interest than ever uh, from uh, our European friends uh, to also be supportive of deepening relations with Taiwan. And I think that is a positive uh, development uh, that we uh, seek to continue to build on. Um, of course, um, China is quite sophisticated in a divide and conquer strategy where they seek to use the same um, economic and political coercion, coercive um, tactics on some European countries. So I think it's important that there is a coordinated uh, strategy, a coordinated stance in terms of uh, responding to such coercion um, in, and, and uh, Taiwan certainly uh, wants to be part of the dialogue and discussion in terms of also sharing uh, our experiences in dealing with these similar challenges. Uh, but also we do want to further develop our ties with the Europeans as part of our uh, global diversification um, strategy in our economic relations. Uh, we, in addition to uh, pursuing a BTA with the United States, uh, being part of the CPTPP uh, in Asia. Uh, we also have a southbound uh, policy, of course, that focuses on our ties with our um, Southeast Asian and South Asian uh, regional neighbors. Uh, but we also do want to um, strengthen our trade and commercial relations uh, with Europe. And, and um, we do appreciate that there is a growing contingency in Europe uh, supporting that as well. Um, I think there's another important area, and that is uh, Taiwan's international participation uh, in the World Health Organization. And um, there have been a growing um, there has been a growing group of like-minded countries that are uh, willing to support Taiwan in different ways, uh, some public and some not so public, uh, but supportive of Taiwan's meaningful participation. Uh, many of those countries are in Europe, and, and we also do uh, very much appreciate that. 
Steve alluded a couple times to Taiwan's uh, COVID diplomacy, as it were. Taiwan has offered uh, expertise and material assistance to other countries, and uh, I think that's uh, improved or you know, bolstered Taiwan's international reputation. Uh, part of Taiwan's uh, success on that front has been it's been remarkably successful at home uh, in containing uh, the COVID outbreak. And as as you say, the Taiwan's exclusion from the WHO uh, has been all the more striking. The last time we had something that looked like it was headed toward being a pandemic, SARS, uh, back in 2003 or so, uh, Taiwan, I think, responded to that, put in place the healthcare system and the public health system that helped keep uh, keep COVID under control. But one of the long-term consequences of that was Taiwan did get access to the WHO. It, for eight years, was allowed to attend the WHA meetings, yes, on an ad hoc basis, yes, under a, an insulting name, but there was access. Post-COVID, doesn't seem like the WHO, WHA is going to budge despite the, the support. Do you see a hope for improvement there? And to the extent that Beijing continues to stand in the way of Taiwan's expanded relationship, uh, are there workarounds that allow Taiwan to get some of the benefit of working with the WHO and provide the, the benefits to uh, the outside world that come from its expertise and its frontline position? Well, I think the coronavirus pandemic has highlighted the necessity of uh, inclusion. Um, Taiwan could have been helpful at an early stage of the pandemic if we had a meaningful role in the WHO. I think that is a fact that is increasingly recognized and, and uh, understood by uh, other countries around the world now. Um, and, you know, last, last March, uh, Congress passed the Taipei Act, uh, which does um, encourage and, and emphasize U.S. support for Taiwan's international participation. It also supports uh, relations uh, with our uh, diplomatic allies. And, and um, uh, we, we hope to work closely with the United States in terms of uh, broadening our partnerships around the world and supporting um, you know, various initiatives such as meaningful participation uh, in the WHO. Um, unfortunately, um, Contrary to Chinese claims that our health, um, our health concerns are already taken care of, um, Taiwan uh, has very, very limited access to WHO uh, technical meetings and um, you know opportunities for sharing uh, public health information. There is some access, but very, very limited. And uh, we hope to continue to expand that and and seek the support of other countries in the process of doing so. And the U.S. may be somewhat more helpful with once we're back in the WHO, which President Biden has announced we're going to do. Um, another international framework that Biden has announced he will have the U.S. rejoin are the Paris Accords. Uh, and Taiwan's, of course, uh, affected by climate change and, and has committed to uh, climate change goals. Is that an area that, that is uh, fruitful for U.S.-Taiwan cooperation? Well, uh, it's certainly a priority of the Biden administration, and I think we are willing to examine some areas uh, of Taiwan expertise where we can also uh, contribute in a positive way. Um, I think the climate change um, agenda, the, you know, certainly does affect Taiwan. Taiwan is a stakeholder, although we are not a um, signatory to the Paris Accords or any other um, major international organization or convention uh, on these issues, uh, but we are a responsible stakeholder and uh, we do seek to contribute uh, on a global level uh, to, to an agenda that supports the world but also supports uh, Taiwan as well. I think some specific possibilities might include um, you know, some industry areas where Taiwan does have some strength. Uh, for example, in uh, uh, in electric uh, vehicles, um, in 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 decreasing our dependency on fossil fuel, you know, there are some technologies, uh, renewable energies, and areas where Taiwan uh, has developed capacities uh, in terms of industry, and uh, we 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 do hope to. Uh, further link our interests and as well as our expertise uh, to the rest of the world on that. Uh, so another question has been in the chat here for a while asking you to uh, elaborate on the upcoming meeting with the Biden administration about supply chains and asking uh, whether that's something of a one-off or, or how it builds on the economic prosperity partnership dialogue. You, you've spoken about this issue earlier in our conversation, but I think this is a request for more uh, detail if you can provide it. 
Yeah, well, we um, in in the meeting I, I spoke of uh, earlier on in this conversation today, uh, the economic partnership dialogue that was launched last November, uh, initiated by Under Secretary of State Keith Kroc and of course our economics team. Um, supply chain security was a very important part of that uh, dialogue. And uh, we, uh, since the discussion last November, uh, we haven't been sitting by idly. Uh, we've been uh, organizing working groups to follow up on those discussions. And uh, one of the working group uh, discussions uh, has um, is uh, will 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 take the form of uh, continuing dialogue between industry as well as government uh, in February, and we do look forward to that. It's such an important area um, that involves um, our economies, um, especially in a post-pandemic recovery phase. Um, I, I think it's important that we identify complementary areas uh, where we can work together to support each other. So one of the uh, just looping back to another topic earlier in our conversation um, about the tactics that China uses toward Taiwan uh, and you have uh, alluded to the political warfare as it were the uh, election hacking. Uh, I, mean, I recall being in Taiwan during the 2020 elections and, and going to the fact check uh, group and basically things that were being done to try to uh, expose attempts to influence Taiwan voters or to poison the political dialogue, as it were. Uh, we have that problem, too, in the US, <laughs> as you may have noticed. Um, are there lessons that the US can learn from how Taiwan has coped with deliberate uh, political disinformation that undermines democratic processes? And are those conversations going on? Well, it's an ongoing challenge. Um, I, I think we have made some progress in, in dealing with this, uh, mainly in uh, public uh, media literacy campaigns, uh, fact checking, especially uh, independent fact checking, um, you know, correcting some of the disinformation campaigns. Um, but it's an ongoing challenge. And Taiwan, like the United States, being open societies where free speech is very much valued, um, it is a, a challenge sometimes in terms of uh, how to put in the mechanisms uh, to 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 uh, limit um, disinformation or irresponsibly um, intentionally malign. Um, efforts at spreading disinformation. Um, these are ongoing challenges. Uh, we have had some conversations uh, with our American counterparts and uh, we intend to continue to do so. But it is really an all of society effort. It's not you know, just a government initiative. It does involve uh, the, the businesses, enterprises, uh, social media companies. It also involves uh, uh, um, concerned citizens, uh, including some of the independent fact checkers and the various applications uh, developed uh, that uh, to, to counter disinformation and such psychological warfare. Um, and we, we will continue to involve our citizens in this process. Um, all of our citizens uh, need to be aware um, that they have to double think the information they get um, and re rethink before resending or or, or being part of the propagation of disinformation. Uh, I think all of this is a very complex process, but we are uh, learning as we go, and uh, we are, are willing to also share those experiences with our partners here. We have a follow-up question in the chat on the climate change and, and environmental issues, uh, which is, uh, well, I'll expand on it a little bit. The uh, you know, Taiwan has long had an issue about what to do about renewable energy. There has been uh, a controversy over getting off of nuclear power, uh, which of course has obvious appeal to certain environmental concerns. But on the other hand, that may mean more dependence on fossil fuels uh, if, if nuclear power is turned away from. Uh, so what's the state of play in Taiwan now in terms of getting to green energy? Well, um, you know, the debate about um, dependency on nuclear power has been in Taiwan for decades. And I think one of the serious challenges, especially since the Fukushima incident, has been um, you know, Taiwan's dense population, uh, potential disastrous effects of, of any uh, compromises of security of such nuclear plants, uh, as well as the ongoing challenge which we have yet to resolve of dealing with nuclear waste. Uh, we are a, a small island with a very dense population. Nobody wants the nuclear waste uh, in any kind of proximity uh, to their home. And so that is 
is a very serious problem. But all of this debate has led to our government making a decision on phasing out um, the nuclear energy and um, creating in an aggressive campaign um, renewable energy sources. And uh, in recent years, some of the larger uh, foreign investments from Europe actually have been in the renewable energy um, area, uh, whether it's solar energy, uh, establishing um, that the grids necessary for storage and delivery, um, also our offshore wind, um, the, 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 the um, windmills, uh, wind energy, uh, that's also a very important. Um, Taiwan's um, western coast, um, the, the area off Taiwan's uh, northwestern um, coast is actually known to uh, be a very uh, very much productive and ideal site for um, wind energy production. And, and we have uh, been working on that. Uh, we, we have a goal of eventually replacing the dependency on nuclear energy uh, through various renewable energies. Of course, new technologies are being developed every day, and we do want to be uh, deeply involved in those uh, developments of uh, new renewable energy um, uh, um, um, uh, uh, projects and also, um, you know, we want to decrease our our use of um, thermal or coal um, energy, and so there is an increasing um, importation of uh, LNG, and and that um, a lot of that comes from the United States. So it's also an area that constitutes an important part of the bilateral trade, especially uh, imports from the United States. Well, we're uh, coming up against our time here. Uh, since we started with an economics question, I guess we'll close with an economics uh, question, uh, which is several in the, in the chat, which I think we can sort of tie into some of the broader domestic policy agenda that President Tsai and the DPP uh, majority in the LY have pursued, which is, is a lot of, um, of kind of social justice, a lot of uh, uh, sort of reform uh, to increase the welfare of, of people who are not so well off in Taiwan. There's also been a push toward the five plus two industries areas, which will take Taiwan more deeply into advanced technology sectors. And I think some of the threads in the, the question here are, what does that mean for uh, Taiwan US economic relations, particularly the competitiveness if Taiwan wage levels generally go up and if Taiwan's economy moves more into sectors uh, that are thought of as as key sectors to the US. So a, 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 a slightly tough question on, on, on where you see the economic trajectory going. Well, um, you know, Taiwan is one of the few countries in the world that had actually a positive economic growth rate um, during 2020. And um, we managed to keep our economy open throughout the COVID pandemic crisis. Um, a part of that growth, um, thanks to the increasing global demand for work from home gadgets and um, technology through which we are having this conversation today too. Um, but, but I think you know, what that reflects is Taiwan's broader strategy of uh, industrial upgrade. That is, we do want to move into um, less labor intensive, but more technology and capital uh, dependent uh, high end technologies. Um, and, and this process has been been taking place over the years um, during President Tsai's um, first uh, term and even uh, up to last year, uh, there were um, they're, they're, you know, increasing the minimum wage, um, enhancing uh, labor rights, uh, reforms in those areas that are sometimes very difficult, of course, um, but uh, reforms nevertheless uh, to achieve a degree of uh, social justice, but at the same time, uh, maintaining rapid economic growth. You know, all of that has been part of a very complex um, um, agenda of this government. Um, in terms of the five plus two areas that have been identified uh, by President Tsai's administration, uh, we do intend to move forward. Um, I, I think there might be some areas of competition with the United States, but that is what uh, drives progress, um, you know, in technology, but also economic progress. Um, and but I think besides competition, there are even more areas of uh, complementary uh, mutual support. Uh, as I said, you know, Taiwan's. Uh, semiconductors are a very important component in many U.S. industries, uh, such as in those uh, healthcare devices, um, the auto industry, 
um, many other technologies that work in um, people's homes and 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 office places. You know, all of this is very much complementary. And and by establishing some degree of security in our supply chain, um, if we can move ahead in a bilateral trade agreement, I think it would further um, be a positive uh, enhancement of economic growth in both our countries. OK, well, I think we are uh, up against our time. We could keep going all day, I'm sure, but uh, I'm sure Ambassador Shao has many other things to do. Uh, thank you for a terrifically wide ranging and comprehensive discussion. As always, it's a pleasure to speak with you, and I hope we can all meet in person again in the not too distant future. Uh, to close this out, I'll throw this back uh, to FPRI's President Raleigh Flynn. Thank you again, Ambassador Shao. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Xiao, for a really fascinating and important discussion. Um, we definitely have to have you back further into your uh, tenure, if you're willing. Um, these, these, uh, your observations are always of high interest, uh, not only to our audience here in the United States, but to others around the world and in the Asian region uh, more specifically. Uh, Jacques, I also like to say thank you to you. And I failed to mention that you have a new book, uh, Taiwan Under Tsai, which is co-edited with our senior fellow, June Teufel Dreyer. So um, I just realized I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, anyway, I uh, put in a plug also for, for Jacques' new book with our uh, co-authored or co-edited with June Teufel Dreyer, who's also one of our senior fellows. Uh, thank you all for joining us and a special thank you to Tikro and Ambassador Xiao for, for joining us this morning and, um, and to our audience and supporters and board members. Thank you for joining us and um, take care. Stay well. <laughs>